section three of the american rivals of sherlock holmes this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the american rivals of sherlock holmes the nameless man by rodriguez Atolengui. Mr. Barnes was sitting in his private room with nothing of special importance to occupy his thoughts when his office boy announced a visitor What name asked mr. Barnes? None was the reply You mean said the detective that the man did not give you his name You must have one of course show him in a minute later the stranger entered and bowing courteously began the conversation at once Mr. Barnes the famous detective I believe said he my name is Barnes replied the detective may I have the pleasure of knowing yours I Sincerely hope so continued the stranger the fact is I suppose I have forgotten it Forgotten your name mr. Barnes sent it an interesting case and became doubly attentive Yes said the visitor that is precisely my singular predicament. I seem to have lost my identity that is the object of my call i wish you to discover who i am as i am evidently a full-grown man i can certainly claim that i have a past history but to me that past is entirely blank i awoke this morning in this condition yet apparently in possession of all my faculties so much so that i at once saw the advisability of consulting a first-class detective and upon inquiry i was directed to you your case is most interesting from my point of view i mean to you of course it must seem unfortunate yet it is not unparalleled there have been many such cases recorded and for your temporary relief i may say that sooner or later complete restoration of memory usually occurs but now let us try to unravel your mystery as soon as possible that you may suffer as little inconvenience as there need be i would like to ask you a few questions as many as you like I will do my best to answer do you think that you are a new yorker i have not the least idea whether i am or not you say you were advised to consult me by whom the clerk at the waldorf hotel where i slept last night then of course he gave you my address did you find it necessary to ask him how to find my offices well no i did not that seems strange does it not i certainly had no difficulty in coming here I suppose that must be a significant fact mr. Barnes It tends to show that you've been familiar with New York, but we must still find out whether you live here or not How did you register at the hotel? M. J. G. Remington City you are quite sure that Remington is not your name Quite sure after breakfast this morning. I was passing through the lobby when the clerk called me twice by that name Finally one of the hall boys touched me on the shoulder and explained that I was wanted at the desk I was very much confused to find myself called mr. Remington a name which certainly is not my own before I fully realized my position I said to the clerk why do you call me Remington and he replied because you registered under that name I tried to pass it off, but I'm sure that the clerk looks upon me as a suspicious character what baggage have you with you at the hotel none not even a satchel may there not be something in your pockets that would help us letters for example i am sorry to say that i've made a search in that direction but found nothing luckily i did have a pocketbook though much money in it in the neighborhood of five hundred dollars mr barnes turned to his table and made a few notes on a pad of paper while so engaged his visitor took out a fine gold watch and after a glance at the face was about to return it to his pocket when mr barnes wheeled around in his chair and said that's a handsome watch you have there of a curious pattern too i'm rather interested in old watches the stranger seemed confused for an instant and quickly put up his watch saying no, there's nothing remarkable about it merely an old family relic i value it more for that than anything else but about my case mr. Barnes how long do you think it will take to restore my identity to me? It's rather awkward to go about under a false name. I Should think so said the detective I will do my best for you 
but you've given me absolutely no clue to work upon so that it's impossible to say what my success will be still i think forty-eight hours should suffice at least in that time i ought to have made some discoveries for you suppose you call me again on the day after tomorrow at noon precisely will that suit you very well indeed if you can tell me who i am at that time i shall be more than convinced that you are a great detective as i have been told he arose and prepared to go and upon the instant mr barnes touched a button under his table with his foot which caused a bell to ring in a distant part of the building no sound of which penetrated the private office thus anyone could visit mr barnes in his den and might leave unsuspicious of the fact that a spy would be awaiting him out on the street who would shadow him persistently day and night until recalled by his chief after giving the signal mr barnes held his strange visitor in conversation a few minutes longer to allow his spy opportunity to get to his post how will you pass the time away mr remington said he we may as well call you by that name until i find your true one yes i suppose so as to what i shall be doing during the next forty-eight hours why i think i may as well devote myself to seeing the sights it is a remarkably pleasant day for a stroll and i think i will visit your beautiful central park a capital idea by all means i would advise occupation of that kind it would be best not to do any business until your memory is restored to you business why of course i can do no business no if you were to order any goods for example under the name of remington later on when you resume your proper identity you might be arrested as an impostor by george i had not thought of that my position is more serious than i had realized i thank you for the warning sight-seeing will assuredly be my safest plan for the next two days i think so call at the time agreed upon and hope for the best if i should need you before then i will send to your hotel then saying good morning mr barnes turned to his desk again and as the stranger looked at him before stepping out of the room the detective seemed engrossed with some papers before him yet scarcely had the door closed upon the retreating form of his recent visitor when mr barnes looked up with an air of expectancy and a moment later a very tiny bell in a drawer of his desk rang indicating that the man had left the building the signal having been sent to him by one of his employees whose business it was to watch all departures and notify his chief a few moments later mr barnes himself emerged clad in an entirely different suit of clothing and with such alteration in the color of his hair that more than a casual glance would have been required to recognize him when he reached the street the stranger was nowhere in sight but mr barnes went to a doorway opposite and there he found written in blue pencil the word up whereupon he walked rapidly uptown as far as the next corner where once more he examined a doorpost upon which he found the word right which indicated the way the men ahead of him had turned beyond this he could expect no signals for the spy shadowing the stranger did not know positively that his chief would take part in the game the two signals which he had written on the doors were merely a part of a routine and intended to aid mr barnes should he follow but if he did so he would be expected to be in sight of the spy by the time the second signal was reached and so it proved in this instance for as mr barnes turned the corner to the right he easily discerned his man about two blocks ahead and presently was near enough to see remington also the pursuit continued until mr barnes was surprised to see him enter the park thus carrying out his intention as stated in his interview with the detective entering at the fifth avenue gate he made his way towards the menagerie and here a curious incident occurred the stranger had mingled with the crowd in the monkey house and was enjoying the antics of the mischievous little animals when mr barnes getting close behind him deftly removed a pocket handkerchief from the tail of his coat and swiftly transferred it to his own on the day following shortly before noon mr barnes walked quickly into the reading room of the fifth avenue hotel in one corner there is a handsome mahogany cabinet containing three compartments 
each of which is entered through double doors, having glass panels in the upper half. About these panels are draped yellow silk curtains, and in the center of each appears a white porcelain numeral. These compartments are used as public telephone stations, the applicant being shut in so as to be free from the noise of the outer room. Mr. Barnes spoke to the girl in charge and then passed into the compartment numbered two. Less than five minutes later, Mr. Leroy Mitchell came into the reading room. His keen eyes peered about him, scanning the countenances of those busy with the papers or writing. And then he gave the telephone girl a number and went into the compartment numbered one. About ten minutes elapsed before Mr. Mitchell came out again, and having paid the toll, he left the hotel. When Mr. Barnes emerged, there was an expression of extreme satisfaction upon his face. Without lingering, he also went out, but instead of following Mr. Mitchell through the main lobby to Broadway, he crossed the reading room and reached 23rd Street through the side door. Thence he proceeded to the station of the elevated railroad and went uptown. Twenty minutes later, he was ringing the bell of Mr. Mitchell's residence. The Buttons, who answered his summons, informed him that his master was not at home. He usually comes in to luncheon, however, does he not? asked the detective. Yes, sir, responded the boy. Is Mrs. Mitchell at home? No, sir. Miss Rose? Yes, sir. Ah, then I'll wait. Take my card to her. Mr. Barnes passed into the luxurious drawing-room and was soon joined by Rose, Mr. Mitchell's adopted daughter. I am sorry Papa is not at home, Mr. Barnes, said the little lady, but he will surely be in to luncheon if you will wait. Yes, thank you. I think I will. It is quite a trip up, and being here I may as well wait a while and see your father, though the matter is not of any great importance. Some interesting case, Mr. Barnes? If so, do tell me about it. You know I am almost as interested in your cases as Papa is. Yes, I know you are, and my vanity is flattered. But I am sorry to say that I have nothing on hand at present worth relating. My errand is a very simple one. Your father was saying a few days ago that he was thinking of buying a bicycle. And yesterday, by accident, I came across a machine of an entirely new make, which seems to me superior to anything yet produced. I thought he might be interested to see it before deciding what kind to buy. I'm afraid you're too late, Mr. Barnes. Papa had bought a bicycle already. Indeed, what style did he choose? I really do not know, but it is down in the lower hall if you care to look at it. It is hardly worth while, Miss Rose. After all, I have no interest in the new model, and if your father has found something that he likes, I won't even mention the other to him. It might only make him regret his bargain. Still, on second thoughts, I will go down with you, if you'll take me into the dining room, and show me the head of that moose which your father has been bragging about killing. I believe it has come back from the taxidermists. Oh, yes, he is just a monster. Come on. They went down to the dining room, and Mr. Barnes expressed great admiration for the moose's head, and praised Mr. Mitchell's skill as a marksman. But he had taken a moment to scrutinize the bicycle which stood in the hallway, while Rose was opening the blinds in the dining room. Then they returned to the drawing room, and after a little more conversation, Mr. Barnes departed, saying that he could not wait any longer, but he charged Rose to tell her father that he particularly desired him to call at noon on the following day. Promptly, at the time appointed, Remington walked into the office of Mr. Barnes and was announced. The detective was in his private room. Mr. Leroy Mitchell had been admitted but a few moments before. Ask Mr. Remington in, said Mr. Barnes to his boy, and when that gentleman entered, before he could show surprise at finding a third party present, the detective said, Mr. Mitchell, this is the gentleman whom I wish you to meet. Permit me to introduce you to Mr. Mortimer J. Goldie, better known to the sporting fraternity as G. J. Mortimer the champion short-distance bicycle rider who recently rode a mile in the phenomenal time of 1.36 on a three-lap track. As Mr. Barnes spoke, he gazed from one to the other of his companions with a half-quizzical and wholly pleased expression on his face. Mr. Mitchell appeared much interested, but the newcomer was evidently greatly astonished. He looked blankly at Mr. Barnes a moment, 
then dropped into a chair with the query how in the name of conscience did you find that out that much was not very difficult replied the detective i can tell you much more indeed i can supply your whole past history provided your memory has been sufficiently restored for you to recognize my facts as true mr barnes looked at mr mitchell and winked one eye in a most suggestive manner at which that gentleman burst into hearty laughter finally saying we may as well admit that we are beaten goldie mr barnes has been too much for us but i want to know how he has done it persisted mr goldie i have no doubt that mr barnes will gratify you indeed i am as curious as you are to know by what means he has arrived at his quick solution of the problem which we set for him i will enlighten you as to detective methods with pleasure said mr barnes let me begin with a visit made to me by this gentleman two days ago at the very outset his statement aroused my suspicion though i did my best not to let him think so he announced to me that he had lost his identity and i promptly told him that his case was not uncommon i said that in order that he might feel sure that i did not doubt his tale but truly his case if he was telling the truth was absolutely unique men have lost recollection of their past and even have forgotten their names but i have never before heard of a man who had forgotten his name and at the same time knew that he had done so a capital point mr barnes said mr mitchell you were certainly shrewd to suspect fraud so early well i cannot say that i suspected fraud so soon but the story was so improbable that i could not believe it immediately i therefore was what i might call analytically attentive during the rest of the interview the next point worth noting which came out was that although he had forgotten himself he had not forgotten new york for he admitted having come to me without special guidance i remember that interrupted mr goldie and i think i even said to you at the moment that uh, it was significant and i told you that it at least showed that you had been familiar with new york now this was better proven when you said that you would spend the day at central park and when after leaving here you had no difficulty in finding your way thither do you mean to say that you had me followed i made sure that no one was after me well yes you were followed said mr barnes with a smile i had a spy after you and i followed you as far as the park myself but let me come to the other points in your interview and my deductions you told me that you had registered as mr m j g remington this helped me considerably as we shall see presently a few minutes later you took out your watch and in that little mirror over my desk which i use occasionally when i turn my back upon a visitor i noted that there was an inscription on the outside of the case i turned and asked you something about the watch when you hastily returned it to your pocket with the remark that it was an old family relic now can you explain how you could have known that supposing that you had forgotten who you were neatly caught goldie laughed mr mitchell you certainly made a mess of it there it was an asinine slip said mr goldie laughing also now then continued mr barnes you readily see that i had good reason for believing that you had not forgotten your name on the contrary i was positive that your name was a part of the inscription on the watch what then could be your purpose in pretending otherwise i did not discover that for some time however i decided to go ahead and find you out if i could next i noted two things your coat opened once so that i saw pinned to your vest a bicycle badge which i recognized as the emblem of the league of american wheelmen oh oh cried mr mitchell shame on you goldie for a blunderer i had entirely forgotten the badge said mr goldie i also observed the detective went on little indentations on the sole of your shoe as you had your legs crossed which satisfied me that you were a rider even before i observed the badge now then we come to the name and the significance thereof had you really lost your memory the choosing of a name when you registered at the hotel would have been a haphazard matter of no importance to me but as soon as i decided that you were imposing upon me i knew that your choice of a name had been a deliberate act of mind one from which deductions could be drawn ah now we come to the interesting part said mr mitchell i love to follow a detective when he uses his brains the name is registered and i examined the registry to make sure was odd three initials are unusual a man without a memory 
and therefore not quite sound mentally, would hardly have chosen so many. Then why had it been done in this instance? What more natural than that these initials represented the true name? In assuming an alias, it is the most common method to transpose the real name in some way. At least it was a good working hypothesis. Then the last name might be very significant. Remington. The Remingtons make guns, sewing machines, typewriters, and bicycles. Now this man was a bicycle rider, I was sure. If he chose his own initials as a part of the alias, it was possible that he selected Remington because it was familiar to him. I even imagined that he might be an agent for Remington Bicycles, and I had arrived at that point during our interview, when I advised him not to buy anything until his identity was restored. But I was sure of my quarry when I stole a handkerchief from him at the park, and found the initials M. J. G upon the same marked linen on your person exclaimed mr mitchell worse and worse will never make a successful criminal of you goldie perhaps not i shan't cry over it i felt sure of my success by this time continued mr barnes yet at the very next step i was balked i looked over a list of l a w members and could not find a name to fit my initials which shows as you will see presently that as I may say too many clues spoil the broth without the handkerchief I would have done better next I secured a catalogue of the Remingtons which gave a list of their authorized agents and again I failed returning to my office I received information from my spy sent in by messenger which promised to open a way for me he had followed you about mr. Goldie and I must say you played your part very well so far as avoiding acquaintances is concerned but at last you went to a public telephone and called up someone my man saw the importance of discovering to whom you had spoken and bribed the telephone attendant to give him the information all that he learned however was that you had spoken to the public station at the fifth avenue hotel my spy thought that this was inconsequent but it proved to be at once that there was collusion and that your man must have been at the other station by previous appointment as that was at noon a few minutes before the same hour on the following day that is to say yesterday i went to the fifth avenue hotel telephone and secreted myself in the middle compartment hoping to hear what your partner might say to you i failed in this as the boxes are too well made to permit sound to pass from one to the other but imagine my gratification to see mr mitchell himself go into the box and why asked mr mitchell why as soon as i saw you i comprehended the whole scheme it was you who had concocted the little diversion to test my ability thus at last i understood the reason for the pretended loss of identity with the knowledge that you were in it i was more than ever determined to get at the facts knowing that you were out i hastened to your house hoping for a chat with little miss rose as the most likely member of your family to get information from oh fie mr barnes said mr mitchell to play upon the innocence of childhood i am ashamed of you all's fair etc well i succeeded i found mr goldie's bicycle in your hallway and as i suspected it was a remington i took the number and hurried down to the agency where i readily discovered the wheel number fifty eighty six is ridden by g j mortimer one of their regular racing team I also learned that Mortimer's private name is Mortimer J. Goldie. I was much pleased at this because it showed how good my reasoning had been about the alias, for you observe that the racing name is merely a transposition of the family name. The watch, of course, is a prize, and the inscription would have proved that you were imposing upon me, Mr. Goldie, had you permitted me to see it. Of course, that was why I put it back in my pocket. I said just now, said Mr. Barnes, that without the stolen handkerchief, I would have done better. Having it, when I looked over the L.A.W. list, I went through the G's only. Without it, I should have looked through the G's, J's, and M's, not knowing how the letters may have been transposed. In that case, I should have found G. J. Mortimer, and the initials would have proved that I was on the right track. You have done well, Mr. Barnes, said Mr. Mitchell. I asked Goldie to play the part of a nameless man for a few days to have some fun with you. But you've had fun with us, it seems. 
though I am conceited enough to say that had it been possible for me to play the principal part, you would not have pierced my identity so soon. Oh, I don't know, said Mr. Barnes. We are both of us a little egotistical, I fear. Undoubtedly. Still, if I ever set another trap for you, I will assign myself the chief role. Nothing would please me better, said Mr. Barnes. But, gentlemen, as you have lost in this little game, it seems to me that someone owes me a dinner at least. I'll stand the expense with pleasure, said Mr. Mitchell. Not at all, interrupted Mr. Goldie. It was through my blundering that we lost, and I'll pay the piper. Settle it between you, cried Mr. Barnes, but let us walk on. I am getting hungry. Whereupon they adjourned to Delmonico's. End of The Nameless Man by Rodriguez Atolengui